All right, thank you, Megan. Hey, grab your Bible. I uh, hope you brought your Bible today. We've been um, kind of, you know, often put the, the scripture and such on the screen. Not going to do that so much today, so I hope you brought your Bible. It's always the text for this course. Bring your Bible. Some of y'all, no judgment, maybe a little. Uh, bring your Bible today and every Sunday uh, we're opening the Word of God. So carry it with you, bring it with you, hold on to it, love it, and all those good things. If you're online, we welcome you. But a lot of you are new today. I've met some guests who are first-timers, and you are our guests, honored guests. We're glad that you're here. So, wow, there's a lot going on in the world. If you're like me, I'm watching all this in Ukraine, and it's making me a little crazy. I'm wondering what we can do. And Megan is right. We can do something. I mean, you, you really can. So go to our website. She, she talked about the link there that's going to help you out. But uh, what we're seeing, gang, let's, let's, let's frame this a little bit. We're seeing with greater clarity what's really going on in the world. And it's hard to watch. We're seeing total depravity. Sin at work in the world. That's what we're seeing. Now, you might go, well, yeah, okay. But, but here's the deal. This is evil. This is, we've talked about this a lot. This is demonic evil forces in the world. And so we're singing about Jesus reigning over it all. And, you know, you're going, uh, is he really though? What? It doesn't look like he is. Is he really the king who reigns over all things? Listen, I've read the last chapter of this book. God wins. <laughs> Jesus reigns forever and ever. And his people win along with him. Now, until then, what we're trying to do is bring his kingdom as he lives in us. He advances the kingdom by his spirit. There is a spiritual realm that, that we can't see unless we watch for it with spiritual eyes, with a heart that wants to serve the world. But we're seeing the state of the human heart being played out. I mean, what Vladimir Putin is doing, he's leading an evil force into a, a um, gosh, a, a democratic state, a sovereign nation, and he's coming in and they're taking out innocent people, civilians. I mean, it is, it's hard to watch. And then watch President Zelensky. I'm praying for him, I mean, for his family, for all the people there. Praise God, we have pastors there, friends that we know at East West Ministries. A uh, good friend of mine, Elijah Brown, who, who taught, preached here not too long ago, president of the B, uh, BWA, the Baptist World Alliance. He's there. He was sending me text. I was praying for him last week. He's there as the inv invasion is taking place. Pastors are there. Churches, Christians are, I mean, think about it. I've thought about this. What if half of our building was blown out this morning? What if it was happening here? What would we be doing? I don't know if you've thought about that. I, I, I believe we would be here serving people in our city who are in need. That's what I believe would be happening. And that's what's happening there. So, so what I want us to do today, though, is really get our hearts under this. How is it that a madman, like a, a, a tyrant, how does this happen in the world? And, and as Christians, we again, we see the world differently. It's the fallen nature of the human heart. And you don't have to go far back in history. You know, we always point to Hitler killing six plus million Jews during the Holocaust. He's not even among the top three of the worst, most evil tyrants in history. I mean, when you consider Mao Zedong, he was, he, he in essence was the one who murdered, killed 70 million people. Or Genghis Khan, 30 million people. Chiang Kai shek, 18.5 million people. How does it happen? How do thousands of people now following his commands, right? Putin's, how are they going in and killing children and women? It makes you crazy, does it not? And how is it that Jesus somehow is Lord of over all this? You know, it was Lord Acton. You, you probably know the, the famous quote, power tends to corrupt and absolute power, what? Corrupts absolutely. And then he goes on to say, almost all great men are bad men. Now, it begs the question, right? what is great? In, in, in that scenario, we're, we're defining great as people of power and influence, because that's what we do in our world. Putin's a great man? It's, he seems evil to the core. 
What's happening in the world? People are sinning. It's not new. Satan is scheming. PO, uh, uh, geopolitical um, ideologies are warring. Christ's church and Jesus as king, he's prevailing. And you go, I don't know if I can see that. I want us to talk about that today and how we make sense of all this. Imagine if Russia had a leader that was a benevolent leader. What if he really was there and, and, and spoke truth to the people, not a, this, this disinformation campaign? What if they had a leader that was loving? What if, what if he, was, he sought the common good of the people and their neighbors? Of course, this is the kind of leader we all want, isn't it? We want leaders like that in our communities, in our homes, in our churches, in our own families. We want to see people who lead that way, and yet everything seems broken, doesn't it? But we have a king. There really is a king who does reign over it all. We need a king who unites us together, don't we? We need a king who's going to draw people from all nations, every language, every person, race and color all together. That's what we need. And we, friends, we have hope because we have a king and his name is Jesus. And what we're going to do over these next months as we move towards Easter and beyond, we're, we're calling this series that we're launching today in the book of Matthew. We're going to be, we're going to be looking at the gospel according to Jesus. And an ongoing theme throughout the year is that Jesus is king, if you've been with us at all. His kingdom is coming. We're praying for his kingdom to come on earth as it is in the very heart and will of God, as it is in heaven here. And so what Matthew does for us, and we're going to be going all the way into the summer with this series. But Matthew has a central theme, and it's this. Jesus is king. And for us to really understand what this means changes everything for us. Because you see, what he's trying to do, Matthew is writing to Jews first. This is important to know. Kind of like, what kind of proof might you bring if you want Jewish people to know that he is the king? We're going to see this today. And what I want you to see is that Jesus is the king. He's the king of superstars. He's the king of outsiders. He's the king of failures. And he is the king of nobodies. People like you and me. And what I'm going to do is go through the first... Um, 17 verses of Matthew chapter 1, and I'm guessing that you've never heard a sermon on this passage. We jump to verse 18, we kick into the Easter, I mean the Christmas story, and what I'm going to do is show you what Matthew wants you to see. He is saying Jesus shows up, but there's, there's a story going on. This is, it's been said his story, history is his story. And he wants you to see where Jesus falls in the grand scheme of things, and this is important to remember, friends, listen, this is important. There is a grand scheme of things. God is at work in our world right now. And he's at work in your life in ways that you cannot see. When everything looks like it's falling apart, he's at work. And that's what this passage is going to remind us of today. So here we go. Never before this passage read in a sermon that you've ever heard. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. So there's, you know that, right? Jacob, and then he had the 12 sons, 12 tribes of Israel. You're tracking with me so far, right? We know these people, Abraham, Isaac, okay, Jacob, wow. And Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, by Tamar, and Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Amenabad, Aminadab, the father of Neshem, Neshem, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, and by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David was the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah, whose name was Bathsheba. And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asaph, Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat was the father of Joram, Joram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham was the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh, Manasseh was the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, Josiah, was the father of jo jo Jeconiah, Jeconiah, oh, and his brothers during the time of the deportation, that's the exile. And after the deportation to, to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. 
Shealtiel was the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abiud. Abiud, the father of Eliakim. Eliakim, the father of, uh, of Azar. Azar, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Achim. Achim, the father of Iliad. Iliad, the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of Mathan. Mathan, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations. David to the deportation of Babylon, 14 generations. The deportation to Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. Amen and amen. And you about fell asleep, except that you were a little nervous about how I was going to get through some of these names. So you stuck with me. What, what is happening here? What's going on? Well, first of all, let me just say that, that he's, it's really interesting. Matthew breaks this down in some kind of thematic way. And he says there are 14 generations, 14 and 14. There's a lot that's been said about that. As if he's saying, and I won't go into all the details there, but as he's saying, David and David and David, he's David and David. He wants you to know about, about David, and, and there's a way that these, these um, uh, Hebrew letters are, are matched up with numbers and all the, this kind of stuff, and there's a lot of that. We're not going to go there today. We can't get into every, uh, every person here, every name, but what he is saying is that every name matters. Um, in fact, he, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, name every person that is a part of the lineage. We know this. He's somehow bringing a theme that his original hearers and original leaders would have understood. And, and what he's trying to do, has anybody seen The Chosen? Have you ever seen, anybody seen The Chosen? You, if you've seen The Chosen, you know that Matthew is, is portrayed as, as um, a young man who's on, on the spectrum, on the autistic spectrum. And he's looking for numbers. He's a tax collector. He's, and, and, and it's like passages like this. Like they're going, what is he thinking? What is, it, what is the 14 to 14? He's got, he's got some, something in his mind that his original hearers would have understood a lot better than us. But we're going we're gonna to pull from this passage and we're going to see that Jesus is king of all of us. And so if you're going to prove to a group of people, Hebrews in particular, Jewish people, what, might, what proof might you bring? Watch this. Verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, if you're tracking with me, you know much about the Bible, you're going, okay, he's starting out with a bang because what he's doing, in fact, look at this. The word genealogy actually is the word genesis in the Greek. You hear the word genesis. He's saying now it's as if, you know, we've got these hundreds of years where there's silence and then suddenly now comes Jesus after the deportation, the exile, Okay, all their rulers and kings led them into exile. And then, G, then they go back, okay, and then they're rebuilding the temple, the second temple. And then there's this period of silence. Then Jesus comes. Matthew is saying, look, okay, every, again, every original reader here would have, would have seen this. This is a, now, here comes the new origin. There's a new Genesis. There's a new beginning. There's a new creation that's coming. It's like reading Genesis 1. Then he gives him three titles that every first century Jew would have, would have captured and gone, wait, 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 what? He starts the verse one by beginning with Jesus and going back. But here's how he outlines the, this whole passage or the, uh, the genealogy. First, he's the son of Abraham. He is the promise one to come from Genesis 12. Remember, Abraham was to bless the nations. Like, how's that going to happen? And then he's to be of the line, the lineage of David. He's the son of David, verses 6 through 11, the house of David, the king, the ruler. And then he is Jesus Christ. Heshua in Hebrew, God saves. And then you can give him this last name. His last name is Christ. Christos, which is the word translated out of the Hebrew, which is the word Messiah. God saves through the Messiah this is the one we've been waiting for. It's Jesus. And then look at verse two. Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Again, the 12 sons, the tribe. These are our people. So the first thing I want you to see here, if you're taking notes, four points today. The first one, he's the king. Jesus is the king of superstars. He is the king. I mean, right here we have the rock stars. These are the heroes of the faith, Right? And you might be thinking, well, I'm not a rock star. I'm not a superstar. Hang on. These are the most influential people who, of our faith, right? You could argue that Abraham, apart from Jesus, I could argue. Some might say, well, isn't it Moses? Abraham's the father of three world religions, in essence. 
I mean, we're still thousands of years later. He's, he's kind of the father of all of us, isn't he? He's father Abraham. He had many sons. And many sons had father Abraham. Anybody? I am one of them. And so are you. So let's all praise the... And if you're new, you're going like, this is a cult. What are y'all doing? I don't know. <laughs> this is like scary. I don't even know what, you're, what y'all are doing. Um, a little song that we learned when we were kids sometimes growing up in churches. And because he's the, he's the man. We're singing about him. He's, he's like the OG, right? He's the one. He is the original one. I was the original gangster. He's the original man of faith. Because by, faith, by his faith, he was reckoned, reckoned as righteous. Not by his works, is what Paul says, going back to Abraham, the man. So he mentions here, uh, Matthew says, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David. In verse 6, Solomon. These are the rock stars of our faith. Every major marker of success is seen in these men. Think about it. Founders, entrepreneurs, literature, art, music, wealth, wisdom, power, strength. Any measure of any greatness, these men have it. And, you know, we live today, we live in a celebrity culture today, don't we? I mean, you might go, I don't know these guys are celebrities. But, no, these are the men of faith. Jesus is king. His genealogy comes from the superstars. Yes, he's the God, the king over superstars. And you may think, I'm not a superstar. But, you know, we love superstars, don't we? We follow them on social media. I mean, they might be people like Justin. You know, we follow Bieber. or We want to see what's up with LeBron or some sports figure, Luca. Right? Ronaldo. Anybody? Thank you. The most followed person on the planet, by the way, if you don't know who Christian Ronaldo is, right? Some say the greatest soccer player on the planet, unless you might think Messi is, is actually better. But they're all getting a little older. He's getting older. But, 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 but my point is people follow. We, we love. We love superstars. We love people like Steve Jobs, inventors, you know, entrepreneurs. We, how about, um, gosh, Elon Musk meeting with Zelensky, President Zelensky, yesterday? Like, hey, we need, we need like, lo, you have some low-orbiting satellites. Can we, can we hook up our internet? Got it. We got you. And he's going to do it again, Starlink, whatever that is. I mean, we love people like this. Like, we, we love to follow these kind of people. But here's the thing. Jesus reigns and rules over every superstar. And there's coming a day when Vladimir Putin, who thinks he's a superstar, evidently, he's going to bow the knee to Jesus Christ. He's going to bow before Jesus. And so will Elon Musk. Jesus wants to capture Musk's heart. He's doing a lot for the common good. And how about this? Sometimes superstars do get it. I mean, Justin is really bold about his faith in Jesus. Some of y'all know Kanye West a couple years ago. He, he dropped an album after coming to Christ called Christ is King. Some noted he says Jesus more in his album than a lot of preachers do from the, from the pulpit today. Now he's, he's a little crazy, but he's still, he's a believer. <laughs> he's a brother. I think his name now is Ye. I think his name is Ye. <laughs> and I think it's Ye, like Ye must be saved, I think is what, is what it is. But my point is this, sometimes superstars turn to him. Every superstar will bow to Jesus because he's above them all. But this, this, um, this genealogy shows that he, he's, the, he's the king of superstars. Now you're saying, what's that got to do with me? I'm not a superstar. Not so fast. Why is it everybody around the world, now we get a little prideful about this, but people, why does everybody want to come to America? Because you're a superstar. That's why. People want to get in on it. People want to be like you. We live in the golden age of human history. We really do, and especially here in America. And so we have a lot, and sometimes that's the very thing that keeps us from bowing before our king. We think we're king. I got everything I need. And we, we just, we think, well, I'm kind of the king. I think I'm the one kind of helping make this happen. Listen, here's the thing. How does it relate to you? You might be in here and be in the fifth grade. And you may be a popular kid at school, more than you know. You might be really good at something. Maybe you're in high school, you play on this particular team, or you're making good grades, and people, somebody's looking at you. In this room, we have influential business leaders sitting here listening to me right now or watching me online. A lot of you are in places of influence. You have some kind of cultural power. 
And some people, more than you know, somebody's looking at you. If you're a parent, you're the superstar. I don't know if your kids are in middle school, high school. You're like, they don't think I'm a superstar. Not really. You're the superstar. You're the one. You're the person of influence. You carry a lot of weight and influence. And some of you are, are leading groups of people or leading a company. And, and you know, you've heard it said, it's lonely at the top. Listen, you don't have to be lonely. I mean, there are decisions you have to make as a leader. You can't abdicate. You've got to make the decision. And sometimes that feels really lonely. That's a hard place to be until you realize you're not alone because you're not at the top. Jesus is king. And you bow to him and you pursue him. You seek to do what's right and best by his leadership in your life, in your heart. You are not alone, friend. And if you are any kind of a superstar, he is your king. He's king of all of us. It's why Paul calls him preeminent. He towers over everyone, right? It, we were singing about it earlier, but Colossians 1 proclaims it. He is the image of the invisible God. Listen to this, the firstborn of all creation. By him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions. See that? Power, rulers, kings, authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. He's the head of the body. He is the one we point to. He's the leader of our church. He's the pastor, shepherd of our church. He's the beginning, first born of the dead. He's the first installment of us following along in resurrection. He's the first one and we follow that in everything he might be preeminent. He's above it all. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Today, we're going to close our time with the Lord's Supper. We're going to proclaim him king. And if Jesus is not king of your life today, just bow your heart before him today. Commit yourself anew to him today. He's the king of superstars. And you might think, well, a king that hangs out with superstars, that's not new. I mean, that's, you know, people hanging out, kings hanging out with influential people, that's not news. And you're thinking, I'm not a superstar. In fact, Sometimes I, I feel like I don't even belong. Don't we all feel like that sometimes? Like I'm not a superstar. I'm, and then I, I am in a position, but I blow it all the time. And some of you here today, you felt more like an outsider. I don't feel like I'm in much at all. And over the past couple of years, we've been isolated, pulled out. We've lost friends. We've lost jobs. We've moved here or there. And some, a lot of us are feeling like, I feel like an outsider. Friends, listen, there's hope. There's good news today. Because he's the king of superstars, but he's also the king of outsiders. This is what we see. What jumps off the page here, particularly the first century readers, would have been the fact that there are five women that are mentioned in genealogy. That never happens. That does not happen. And, and, and what we see here is Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary. We see women, they were never placed they, they were frozen out of institutional forms of power, any kind of place. They couldn't be priests. They couldn't be rulers. They couldn't be soldiers where people found their superstars. And so they were pushed aside. And that continues to happen in certain ways here, in our, even in our nation, but certainly across the world. And so here's what we see here. They're not just outsiders because they're women. That's half the story. They are outsiders. And they're mentioned here as descendants of Jesus. Why? Because he's the king of the outsider. Look at this. Tamar seduced her father-in-law. Let's look at each one of them. She was Judah's daughter-in-law. And because she was unwilling, or he was unwilling to give her his youngest son, she ends up then seducing him instead. Rahab was a prostitute. I mean, this is messed up. She saves her whole family in Jericho. You might know that from Jericho's destruction by helping out some, some Israelite spies. Do you know that story? Ruth was a Joabite. She was a widow. She was an outsider. Completely, these women are outsiders whose loyalty to her mother-in-law saves and redeems her family. And then we have Bathsheba. You know her story? She was an adulteress, but yes, albeit because of David leveraging his power and influence to... to um, Gosh, you know, sexually abused, you could argue rape her. She's, she's, she then, she loses her, her husband. She loses a son. 
And yet God continues to use her and she becomes, she's blessed to be the mother of Solomon, who's the only king who could actually had a united kingdom after David. And then Mary is an unwed single mother. Think about how scandalous that would have been in a, in a close-knit Jewish community. These women were, were set aside. They, they all had, d- despite their flaws, d- despite bad decisions and decisions made around them, bad circumstances, bad leadership, they changed the course of history. I'm going to say two things to our girls and to our women. God has empowered you to be a force for his kingdom. We talk about it here. We don't talk about positions and who holds what position. We talk about gifting. God has gifted all of us male and female. He's the one who's chosen to give out spiritual gifts. And women, you are emboldened to serve him. And I know that oftentimes, even in our culture, maybe in evangelicalism, God, God forbid that it happened in our church, that sometimes you feel that you don't have a place. But we're raising up women. We want to continue to raise up women to every place where you have been called to serve. Because you and your life matters. Women have a unique position to influence the world. This past uh, weekend, I, was, I went to Charlotte to meet up with family because we celebrated my mom's 90th birthday. I want you to see my mom. My mom is small, <laughs> but she is big in the kingdom of God. My mom is a spiritual force to be reckoned with. She's the kindest, most loving servant person on the planet. And has arguably influenced my life. That's a red velvet cake, by the way. <laughs> she, she has influenced my life, I could argue more than anyone. I, I praise God for my, my parents. But we were able to go and celebrate my mom and, and you know, do what you, you kind of want to do. She's in really good health, too, by the way, living alone, doing her thing. She's, I mean, amazing. She prays for me every day. She prays for us. She prays, she's the glue that holds our family together. She has served children throughout. Her, she hadn't always been. You know, this age, she served all these years serving children. And when her church was looking for a children's minister, they go, we got one. She's, she's teaching first grade here. She's been doing it for years. Let's let her be the one. And, and so she becomes this children's minister serving. In my, in my family tree, mom is a superstar. And here's the thing. Some of you are moms and you feel like, man, I feel isolated. I was isolated long before the pandemic. I'm talking to the preschoolers all day. And you feel like you, you, maybe you're not influential. This is true for many of us who are parents. And not all of us are called to be parents. But for those of us who are, it may not be something you do that will be the great, greatest thing in your life. It'll be someone you raised. God is at work in your life. And women... We just bless you. We praise God for you. You are a spiritual force, not just in the home, but outside the home, in community, in business, whatever God has called you to do. But sometimes, don't we all feel a little bit like an outsider? Some of you function as an outsider. Let's be honest. Some of you, because of your race, your position, maybe you feel like you lack education, maybe it's your marital status, social status somehow. Some of us in a crowd this size, you may have some kind of criminal past or some mark on you and and you feel like you're defined by your past. And all of us have private sin and things that we've done in the past that we wish we could take back. All of us, we could say who I am hates who I've been. And I'm still not quite where I want to be. Isn't that true? The older I get, I'm like, I thought I'd be further along by now. Because we all feel like we're outsiders. But here's the thing, friends, listen. Jesus is your king. He's my king. Because he was the ultimate outsider. He he, he allowed himself to be kicked, pushed aside, left out, rejected, whipped, and killed because we're all outsiders. We were on the opposite side. None of us were insiders. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so we needed a rescuer. We needed a king to come and rescue us. And he has come. He's come for you and every person here. If you don't know Jesus, today's your day to give your life to him. Friends, let's be those kind of people. We're a church that says everybody's welcome. Let's be a people of inclusion because that's the savior we serve. Don't buy into these narratives of culture that say 
No, no, no. There's us and there's them. And if you watch, I mean, if it's network news or whatever else you're following, the world is saying you need to find your tribe, everybody who's not like you, particularly in, in, in political, partisan politics. If they are on the other side, they are completely wrong. Everything about them wrong. They're messed up. And that's what's happening even in the church. Satan is using this to divide his church. Listen, all of us who are followers of Jesus, Jesus is our king. We are one in him. We're in this together because we have a higher king than anyone we're going to elect into office. Jesus is not running for office. He's already reigning and ruling. He is the king over all of us. I mean, think about this. This is how it's supposed to be from the very start. When you think about Abraham, let me ask you, was Abraham an insider? You know the story? Was he an Israelite? No. He was an outsider. From the very start, God says, I'm going to pull people from the outside in. I'm going to bring everybody, all tribes and nations. Yes, people in Ukraine. Yes, people in Russia. I'm drawing all people to me. And, and God's people are to go and to tell people about him and draw them in. Because Jesus is the king of superstars. He is the king of the outsider. But look at this. He's the king of failures. You see, what we have now are the kings after David in verses 7 through 11. And, and, and we can go quickly through these last two points because... I mean, after, after this, it's like wheels off. These are all these kings that follow David and Solomon are failure by anyone's design. Because for every Uzziah, Hezekiah, or Josiah, there's a Jotham and an Ahaz and a Manasseh. And not one of them had a long enough term to turn things around. They, all these kings led them into exile. Political leaders will lead us into exile if they are not pursuing the Lord. And let's be honest, failure is a major part of every one of our histories. Every one of us. Every one of us have failures of our past. And even this past week, failure is a part of the human condition. Why? Because sin is a part of the human condition. He, he's the king of failures like you and me. And what can happen, friends, don't let this happen to you. We're going to be reminded today, you're forgiven. Sometimes we start to take on I am a failure. No, you're not. Self-condemnation needs to end in your life. You are forgiven. You've been given a new identity. But here's the thing. One last thing. Maybe there's one thing worse than being a, a failure or an outsider or even a superstar, and that's being nobody. Jesus is the king of nobodies. People like you and me. I mean, after Zerubbabel, there's Joseph and Mary and Jesus, but we don't know who these people are. Like you try to study, look at commentaries, but we don't even know who they are. Why? Because most of us will go through life, we will live and die, and nobody will know our name. And all that will matter will be whether you gave your life to Christ or not. Can you name your great-great-grandfather? Can you name your great-great-great-great-grandfather? Your life is to just do God's bidding in your moment, in time, and bam, you're gone. That's it. We live for a short time. We have today. And we have a moment in time. And if we can sing songs about Jesus being king of our lives and it doesn't stir our hearts, there's something wrong. And what might be wrong is that we've done what the Israelites have done. We've run after other kings. We've not run after the king of kings. Listen, unlike Vladimir Putin, the most evil, even the best kings on the planet, pale in comparison. They're not even in the same category as Jesus. He is the focus of our lives. He's the one who came to empty himself. He's the one who was born in human uh, likeness and, 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 and took on the form of a servant, not killing others, but allowing himself to be killed and to die. So that Paul would say of him in Philippians 2, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that's above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue confess, there it is in heaven and on earth, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Putin will bow to Jesus Christ. You and I will bow to Jesus Christ sooner or later, now or then. How about this? Now and then. 
Is he Lord of your life? Give him your life. Bow to him. He is the king. And he's at work in our world in ways we cannot see. By faith, trust in him.